Okay, how's everybody doing? So, what I want to do here is just conduct a, a quick sort of pre-paint analysis or summary about what I've done so far just before I, I go to the paint phase. So, um, I reconditioned these trucks, took all the gearboxes apart, stripped everything in isopropyl alcohol, and these are like new now. They, they're reconditioned. Painted the inside of the wheel sets there by hand with Vallejo kind of rust combination of uh, raw umber and rust paint, like three or four washes just built up, and I really like the way they turned out. Um, you know, removed all the grease, and the, it was like glue, right? Like, you remember how I showed you? Uh, they were horrible. Like, the, they were so sticky, I could have used the, the substance as a glue if I wanted, but now these are beautiful, quite confident in those. The motor's really nice, the drive line is good. I uh, polished up these uh, wheel wipers, the copper wheel wipers, and re-soldered new wires onto them a little bit longer so I can cut them off later to custom fit. Um, and they're kind of this wet noodle from uh, Soundtracks wire. It's, I really like the Soundtracks wire for speakers and this kind of, it has a sort of wet noodly kind of uh, wire to them. They're not stiff and, you know, have memory really, okay? Now, I'll just mention you about the trucks. The trucks are quite good on these. Uh, I've never really had a problem with Atlas trucks, I th like, like side frames, I mean. Uh, there are different versions in terms of how the pickups and wheel wipers work from model to model at times, but the actual castings are quite beautiful. Um, so I didn't do a whole lot to these, but what bothered me, I guess, if I can use that term, was these trucks, okay, when I started to look at the Atlas ones, and I looked at these, I went, I I realized, okay, so something's wrong with this picture or these trucks, right? So I took off the brake cylinder. There was a brake cylinder on here and I removed them because they're not on this unit. Uh, I didn't see any sanding lines, but I added uh, two, one for each side forward on the forward part of the trucks or whatever. And then there's two on this one as well. They must be there somewhere. And then what I thought was significant, because you got to decide what details you're going to add and what you're going to omit, because no uh, model is perfect to the prototype. But see these actuating bars here? That's what I think they are. They're down here, see? I added those. I don't know what they're for. I think they're from these brake cylinders and they work the middle one. Maybe, I don't know, but I added them because I thought they were significant. So when these are painted and weathered up, uh, and highlighted, uh, you'll see them. So they'll be distinct enough, okay? So now here's the uh, unit itself, which I'm quite proud of actually the way it turned out. There doesn't seem like a lot added to it, but there's enough to define the character of this locomotive, okay? Uh, first of all, I'll just go to the top here. These are Cannon and Company fans. They're beautiful, just beautiful. Uh, if you ever want to detail a model, these are really the way to go for EMD anyway. I couldn't find a 36 inch, so I used the one that came with Atlas, which is really good, and they're all see-through, right? So, then I added a CalScale uh, Nathan K5 LLA, because that's the one on this locomotive, at least the one they up upgraded it to, not from 215, but 220 or so they added. And this is more more recent locomotive, I just wanted to build it that way, because my layout actually would suit today and or back to 2010. So it covers about a 20 year span. So now you can see where I uh, added this this bracket, which I don't know, but I think that's a carryover from Southern Pacific when, when Montana Rail Link had this locomotive first before it went to SRY. So maybe they left it on, I don't know. But the, for the lights, they had that kind of a bar with the lights, but it's unusual that it's still there. But that, once again, is a feature, a characteristical feature of this particular locomotive. There's a little broom handle there, which is functional, which I'll slide a broom into. I added a big pilot plate here, and then, of course, all the details. And the new ditch light bezels, MU stands, etc. I didn't change the steps, even though I bought uh, SD40-2 brass steps. These are Atlas. They're really good. They're already per uh, perforated. You know with holes and you got to fold down the brass steps anyway so they look thick anyway so i didn't bother i didn't want to affect the integrity of the structure so because i sort of had to when i drilled for the the pilot uh ditch lights you can see how i detailed the side of the frame i skinned it with plastic 
makes it so much nicer when you like there's piping on here about it you might not see it now you will when it's painted probably but and whenever you add and glue detail parts to like a metal frame try skinning it sand the plastic and the metal first rough and use medium ca skin it good and uh it'll be on there good to go like when you scrape the paint off i mean um, i didn't do the top because i didn't really need to attach anything there you can see all these other details i added to it little pipes and little jacks the jack stands are packed out and the fuel tank, there's a detail kit from Canon, EMD fuel tank. I didn't use all the details. I used a lot of evergreen, though, you'll see here. This is just all custom work from evergreen. And this piping on the top here. And then a lot of this detail on here. Then this is a cow scale electronic bell, which is right. Uh, I don't have a good photo. Oh, yeah, it's right here. So you can see just the end of the tank here. And that's this area right here. Okay. So that looks pretty good. Added this little box. I don't know what that is. It's on some EMDs and some not. I don't know if it's a toolbox or what, but that was important. Uh, I added sunshades. I like to glue these on before I paint them because they fall off all the time, right? Uh, if you can't get a good bond. And I, I drilled them out and I used... Uh, evergreen rod I insert into the cab and then I lay the sunshade on top of the, the two pins, weld it to the two pins and weld it to the cab. I haven't had any of this style ever fail yet, even though I grab a lot of my locomotives and I maybe kiss them now and again. You can see I added a Sinclair and this pogo stick, I think they call them, um, antenna. I don't know if that's VHF, UHF has something to do with that. Uh, if anybody knows, feel free to chime in. Uh, you can see the side details here, these little pipes. I don't know what these are for, but <laughs> to, to purge the toilet. I don't know. <laughs> you better not be standing there when they do it. I don't know. There's these big pipes. There's two on this side and there's one on this side too. So I don't know why, but that's a distinction I wanted to add as well. These little details here. And then, of course, the front pilot I treated the same as the rear. But this has this big steel anvil on the front. I really like the. These are sort of original GP, I think, EMD GP uh, plows, sort of anvil kind of plow, which I found it interesting. It was, they kept it on this locomotive like that. So yeah, and then the grab handles are metal. So I'm pretty happy with that, you know, um, not a lot of changes, but enough there to define the characteristics of 385, okay? So now the fun begins, I get to paint all this and put her together, all right? So I'm just gonna use some rubber black here. I got light coming in the window and black on black never shows that good on video, but I'll try to show some of the effect. This is, um, I don't like to use this flat black. This is rubber black, but I might have added some green to it or something. I, don't, I can't remember, but as long as it's not pure black, I'm happy. You watch the white parts go away. So I'm just going to paint some of this frame. No need for primer. Never used a special primer for painting frames before. I don't care what people say if they say you have to use primer. Why? Tell me why I need to use primer when I'm using Tamiya XF paint, which is already primer anyway. That's what this is, right? If you care to do the research, this is a high quality acrylic primer. XF, flat. That's what it is. 
It's just an underlying coat. So why why put a primer on it when you build up layers subsequently anyway? <laughs> the primer thing is just a lot of a lot of silly marketing. Now, if you're going to paint a brass locomotive, then yeah, use a, a special primer. But this isn't a brass locomotive. These are predominantly plastic parts I'm painting. I don't care about. I'm not putting a heavy. Uh, I'm not going to put a heavy primer coat on before I put finish paint on, and then cover up all my sharp details. No way. Like this little bell here. I'm not going to put primer on that, and then put three more coats of paint on it. And kill all the detail that I paid for. <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to black out all the parts that need to be blacked out. Okay. Okay, so this is just sort of a mid-paint analysis, and I want to just uh, share to you uh, this particular procedure, which is not always the same, because that's just the nature of the hobby. Uh, number one, it depends on the model. Number two, it depends on the weathering and the finish of the model, like according to the prototype. And uh, number three, um, it depends on the scale. So see so that like that is just a feel thing that comes from experience that you can't really teach like the best teacher is always actually attempting something and uh, i've mentioned this before you take out old athrum blue box whatever just 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 start doing stuff though as soon as you start shooting paint the sooner the better okay and you just gain confidence you can't like you can't achieve anything without experience it just you'll always be a rookie all right, first time rookie, if you just think in your head, well, I've seen it done, I know how it's done, I saw a boomer do it, I can do it. No, you have to do it, right? You gotta take this kind of a lesson and then use it as a motivator and then go for it and try stuff. Now, I have painted these, uh, that flat black, right? Okay, so these are uh, been now coated in semi-gloss, and I'll tell you why. So this is just a base color. It's it's actually going to play, but it's the primer. that Like, I don't believe in putting on a heavy coat of primer and then a bunch of thin washes. Like, why do I want to build up thick paint? The trick is thin paint, especially smaller the scale, the more thin paint you want to use, really. I'm not talking about color. I'm just talking about the, you know, the physicality of the layers of paint. Because why would you want to cover up all the details? Because they start to get fat. Every layer of heavy paint you lay on a, on a, on a cable, a nut an engraving, a washer, you know, a bolt, it just starts to get a fat look to it, right? And I've noticed locomotives like this, like factory painted locomotives get like that too, especially if they're cast trucks or something, they all have this rounded, like there's no sharp corners where there should be. There's no crispness to the model, right? They just get fat with paint. And some model train manufacturers are guilty of that. It's just the type of system that they use to produce models in production, right? But when you do your own, you can avoid that when you get an undeck and you lay on thin layers of paint. Now, I paint just about everything with flat. This is flat blue, which will be the blue I put on this. 
and then I'm going to cover it with clear coat later or semi-gloss. But like this particular photo, I'll just show you. So this, like this very new paint job here. So I'm after the weathered trucks, the newer paint job, but with weathering. See the tank? Like that tank, like I was right up beside this locomotive. Like when you wipe your finger across it, like if you rub it, there's this glossy black underneath. Okay. But it doesn't look black, right? See all the weathering and the and the ballast dust kicked up and so on. And so that's all something I can do later with a brush and water and Vallejo and so on. But I'm probably going to do a lot of this first with the airbrush, but super thin. Like this, I'm going to do the airbrush. Like this truck, like uh, I'm going to dust that with some buff, some very thin buff to bring it to look like that, th this one. But the fronts are even more than the rear for some reason on both sides. I looked this locomotive over pretty good. And uh, so that's something I'm going to do with the airbrush. Little streaks and things like that I can do by hand, right? So I've painted all these parts semi-gloss because I want to have a little bit of a flow rate. because there's, um, And then I want to seal the flat coat, like the basic coat on this. Like the top part's going to be black here. The basic, you can see it's a little bit of semi-gloss on there see I did that to seal it because at the end I'm going to flat coat just the top surfaces because they're bleached by the sun they go flat really fast but the sides are going to be so I'm going to paint once the flat blue is on there's flat black I'm going to paint again semi-gloss over top I'll just close with telling you how I mix that um, I'm going to hit this you know once the decals are on etc like I'll put a kind of a gloss coat semi-gloss apply the decals and then I'll put on another semi-gloss over top and then flat on the top of here for the final finish. But I don't put gloss paint on models. I just put flats because they're like primer, right? And if you put a gloss finish on, then they become gloss finish. So that's how I do this particular subject matter, okay? It might change with larger scale automotive models or larger scale trains. Like it just depends, right? It's not always the same. But that's what I'm doing here. And you can see that I've done that. And here, I'll just show you the tank before you just point out these three clear coats. So notice the tank here. It's um, fairly shiny. See that? Well, I can dull that down because I can actually mix some flat coat and semi-gloss. But I kind of like that because when I put weathering on that, it's going to tone that down. So I want a little bit of that effect, but that semi-gloss to me a clear over flat black or rubber black in this case or whatever. Rubber black meaning I just add green or a little bit of brown to the black just to give it a little extra, almost a gray tone, but not quite, right? Okay, so it's not pure black. Okay, see that? All right, so that's what I'm going to do there. Now, let me just point out these particular clear coats that I like to use because it's all to me and I like to stick with this one product in the airbrush with flats and clears. So I thin all my flats with 99% isopropyl or 70 or 50, whatever I have at hand, but I have lots of this now. So, and I can add water to this and thin it down. And it really doesn't matter anyway, 50% to 99. There's not a whole lot of difference other than this will be corrosive to these acrylic paints faster if you're removing them or thinning them or dissolving them into scenery, etc. right? But if I'm going to thin any clear coat, uh, I probably don't want to use isopropyl alcohol because I don't want to affect the integrity of the clear coating. Now, I have used this for that, and it didn't seem to be that much difference, but that was with flat coats, though. I've never actually used this with, with pure clear coat, like, like the straight X22. So I use their thinner, their X28 thinner, just to be safe. And uh, one of these bottles, you can make easily three bottles out of one of these for clear coats if you use this, okay? So keep, so when this is empty, see that? This is all empty. These are awesome jars to keep, boy, I'll tell you. And it's funny, like these are five bucks, almost the same price as one bottle of paint, well, here in Canada. But look at the volume. But when this is empty, I use these for like maybe umber colors, like colors I use a lot of. I use these to mix colors with, like for scenery paints and stuff that go a long ways, like for track and ballast and right away buff and stuff, but really thin, right? Like mostly ice, 
like this much isopropyl and then my finger thickness of paint like probably not even like half of that and then the rest isopropyl alcohol yeah way right like that's really how far this paint goes okay Okay, so I have three colors here. I got this dark brown, got this earth brown, and this almost a bit of purple in brown there. It's almost uh, like a mo like a really dark mauve. And so I can't explain the process. I just know from confidence that these are the colors I want in the equation. And artists go by feel. They never overanalyze the work. They go by feel by all their past experiences. They know from trying things in the past they take tons of risk. Like I said before, brave painters become good painters. And they learn all that through uh, just trying stuff. And then they remember the processes and the effects that they get. And so I'm going to add very, like, super light. Like, watch on this brown paper. Like, i got to sit here for quite a while. See how it's starting to build up slow? That's what you want. Like, a tiny amount, okay? This will give it just that super thin uh, rust kind of cast kind of filter. That's once again very, very subtle. And I'm going to do it also on the bottom here as well. So you can't really tell, right? You won't be able to see it, maybe, but I can. But it's this in combination with some of the other colors I'm going to use that are going to make that difference. Oops, sorry. Uh, they're going to have that effect. That's my lavalier cable. Some have said get a wireless, but then you run out of battery in, in the middle of something, and it'll happen right in the middle of something, and you have no battery or your wireless craps out. So it's either or, right? This way, you, if you don't remember, you tend to yank it off the tripod. <laughs> okay, so now uh, I'm going to lose that. That That's pretty much gone. I'm going to get this dark brown, this kind of rail brown. And this is like mostly, mostly IPA. That's just a wet brown paper. But there's enough little bit of brown in there to, to kick up. Like almost like it'll be wet when it goes on. I put that away. That's good enough. Now on these trucks. I just wet them down and let it dry and see what it does. It's been the one nice thing about IPA is uh it dries really fast so you can see the effect. Because you really want to get the cast trucks are, they're not black. And they're not brown either, if you look at them. They're, 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 they're an unexplainable kind of cast steel sort of uh, color. Very subtle. That's it. Sometimes an airbrush is just a couple of passes, but it, it can do more than what a regular uh, paintbrush can do. Okay, so the very final coat was uh, very thin buff. And I mean thin. I mean so thin that you you won't even see it when it goes on. Like, that's the idea. But look at it. Look, I mean, look how it highlights everything. See that? See that? That's the trick. You know, this is a good example. Like, like I put it on here. Like, when it's on here, it's it just hold it long enough on a dark piece of cardboard. And you'll see it coming out. That's what you want, right? Okay, so you just got to always, always test, right, on the side and check the color and what it's doing, right? 
too much and and it and it kills the effect but i really like that so now i can basically come at these if i want with a little like pure black even with a pin wash later with vallejo and just leach a little bit in with the oil on the journals there for the axles things like that um, i i did do a tiny shot of this off camera you can see it right there but boy be careful with this this let this can kill it you got to be so careful with this kind of orangey rust i notice that with people with rust on 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 layouts i mean they'll figure it out eventually i guess but it just too much it's it's just not like that just take a look around out in the world you just don't see that orange rust everywhere standing out like that it's only when you get up close to things okay um so yeah i mean i could put a little bit on the top of the buff on the tops for light coming down but <clears throat> they're gonna fall in the <clears throat> excuse me they're gonna fall in the shadow of the chassis see so you see they're already really light but the final color with thin a couple of thin dark washes will knock that down a bit but i kind of like that actually you know, it's uh the look that i want so i'm pretty happy with that okay Okay, so um, I want to show you how I do some of the final weathering or additional kind of filters over top of the Tamiya. Like these trucks are pretty much finished now. I'm really happy with the way they turned out. So remember how I painted them that kind of rubber black and then I oversprayed some of those very subtle but also incredibly thin. Like I'm talking isopropyl like 95% tinted with 5% paint, right? That's how you get to this kind of depth of color for this cast, these cast trucks. I've done them before, so I think these ones turned out a little bit better, maybe the lot than the last ones I did, but that's, that's just the way it goes though, right? The more you practice, the better you get at it. Um, so you can see these streaks here, this fade, like I'll show you some on the front pilot that I'm gonna sh show you here. Um, after this kind of color, sorry for this photo quality, it's not that great, but you can see this kind of uh, earthy kind of sand and then a little bit of rust. So what I like to do is, is um, like this is the rear part I'll just do. Oh, actually, no, why don't I do the front? Because I already did one coat there, so I'll do some on here. So what you want to do is, is you want to wet down the whole face of the model that you're going to tint or put a filter on so that the paint whatever paint you put on will feather out okay you want soft edges okay so the two colors that i'm going to use i'll show you is this one here number 71.27 it's called light brown okay when you put it on the palette, it looks more, um, well, it looks darker than it does in the bottle. And then there's this rust, 71.80 rust. It's not the orange rust. It's more of a red kind of brown rust, which I really like. Okay. So what I like to do is, is wet it down like that and then just take a little bit of, of uh, first the light brown. And I'm just going to stab a little bit in make sure it's wet so it just floods in and then runs and and kind of fades okay it's almost like a uh, type of oil painting but with acrylics and the advantage once again is that it, that it dries super flat and very fast right you don't have to wait for a day or so and this will change a little bit when it dries, okay? So we'll let that dry, and then I'll show you how I put some of the rust on, okay? 
Okay, so it's almost dry. So you can wait for it to dry or you can actually work in while it's still wet. So we take a little bit of that rust now and I'm just gonna stab a little bit in. Just let it, just a little bit in. Remember, it's gotta be wet. And if it's, if it's holding up too much paint like there, just come in with, dip it and let it run. That's all it took, right? And when it dries, it leaves a really, really cool effect. Um, and I find the less you mess around with it, the better. If you overwork it, just you end up blending it all into one color. And you don't want one color. You want uh, two or three colors, the gray, the sand, and the rusts working separately but blending into each other. That's what a filter is, okay? A filter allows you to see the other colors as well, which are altered by the color that you add in. That's very thin, okay? Okay, so I'm going to show you one way that I use to, uh, to sort of weather down the checker plate walkway or deck on the frame. Just a very thin layer first, and I just wet it down. Not so it's flooded above the checker plate. In fact, if you get too much water on it, just wipe your brush off. Just the water brush, and then just keep it wet. And then come in here. It's a little bit of light brown and aged white blended together. And I'm just going to touch... And see how it feathers out on its own. And then when it dries, it'll dry even lighter. That's the nice thing about it. And then you can add more to it if you want it to be stronger. And you can change it up a bit, or you can put a little bit more at the top of the step where you figure the conductor engineer walks up on a lot. It's all water and acrylic, right? The beauty is, is this will be dry in 10 minutes. And I can put another color on it without mixing it in if I want. See, it's, when you get used to the speed of acrylics, you can achieve some real remarkable weathering effects. There's some steps back here, but see what happens if you don't add water, it gets, it's too opaque. And if you really want to get fancy, you can just put a little touch of rust, like the steps have worn away a bit. Okay. Okay, so time to put some blue on. So I just mixed up my own color. This was, was flat blue, but I've added gloss to this and some sky blue. The uh, new livery on SRY, meaning from like the meatball livery, meaning this here, they call the meatball. And this blue is a little more brighter or lively than the old. Well, you can see this here. I mean, it's deceiving with the, this photo, but the, the older blue with the white line head was much darker. But then this is in bright sunlight, and if you go to the other side, it looks darker. See? So, you know, you just got to go by feel for me. And uh, I like this color here. This looks about right to me. But I'm going to lay on some light coats anyway first, and then I'm going to see how it looks. So you can see I've masked off 
the area that I don't want to get blue paint on. You can do this two ways. You can paint the blue first and then the black. Or you can paint the black first and mask off and paint the blue. It's up, it's up to you. <laughs> um, I like to use this rubber tool. I've used it before. I use it for removing uh, rubber um, mask. And I use it as a final rub down on the tape line. To make sure that uh, it's nice and tight. Sometimes I'll clear coat this just to seal this, but I don't want to do it with this case because um, I don't want to take a chance of lifting some of the paint because it's very thin, that this black. And I meant it to be that way because I didn't want to cover up all the details of the top, especially the top dynamics of the edge of the hood and stuff. I've just got to remember to turn that compressor off so it doesn't kick on while I'm painting. So this is about 50-50 paint to thinner. I didn't use IPA, I just used the recommended thinner. I like this blue actually. So really nice blue actually that. Very SRY-ish. Just want a bit of light spray down over top of the tape first. I don't want to spray up into the tape this way. I want to spray it this way. Okay, because I don't want to get too much build up by accident. Let's say I hit the button too much and I'll get it and it'll seep into the black. Well, there's a chance that it would, but to me a tape is so good and so reliable that um, you don't usually have to worry about that. Now I'm going to slip this over a block of wood. So that I can paint the front nose.
Okay, so the one thing I love about Tamiya is I can demask right away practically. So what I want to do is I'm going to clear coat this, but I want to clear coat the um, the black frame as well because there's decals that go on the frame. I don't want to take any chances for silvering. I know there's there's much debate. And it's, you know, it's a good argument uh, coming from maybe the aircraft modeler side of things, if anybody really cares, but about silvering, what actually causes it. I mean, I know scientifically, I think, what causes it. That's been explained from a porous texture and air getting underneath. But I don't know with all the solutions they have nowadays, I'm not sure if it matters, but I think it does uh, to, to the individual. Like... Um, if you're worried about that, then by all means clear coat first, because uh, I'm not taking any chances. Uh, it, it's happened to me a few times in the past. I just threw decals like right over top of, uh, you know, flat. I want to be careful here that I don't damage any of those front pilot details, right? Um, I'm putting a gloss coat on. I want a smooth, smooth, glassy finish before I put any decals down um, to render them like paint. And then I can flat coat or semi uh, gloss or gloss again over top. Right? I'm not taking any chances. Not with this locomotive, I'm not. So there's a piece there. So you can see just the side of those cabinets is blue and then that's blue. Pretty happy with that. The lines are nice. The lines are always nice with Tamiya tape. Um, you know, some people said, oh, it's expensive. Well, if you're a custom painter and you're painting 12 locomotives a week, then maybe you're going to look for an alternative, but that's just simply not the way it works, right? For the average hobbyist. And, uh, yeah, I want to be careful when I take this tape off here because um, I didn't want to get any overspray, so I kind of taped off the inside as well. I don't like to come back with a brush and, you know, get sloppy with it, but um, see how that line turned out. Yeah. One thing you got to watch out for if you if your paint's too thin is that it can lift with the tape. But I think I clear coated this uh, or with uh, I think I clear coated with semi. Pretty sure I did. So I shouldn't get any lifting. All right, nice. I like that. That is a nice cab. Yeah, that's a nice, nice finish there. I really like that. Okay. So that's going to get clear coated as well. Um, and then this, let's have a look. I wonder if I should try to cut through that part. Sometimes it's good to, uh, to demask as soon as you can, because if the paint dries, especially if there's a clear coat over top, it can lift the color up from the other color that it's laying over top believe like it can happen okay it doesn't always but anything can happen in this game you got to be prepared and uh, it's nice when you can get away with no paint damage when you demask there that's beautiful now I have not done 
That's a beautiful line. I love Tamiya tape. Like this tape is no fail. Like really, like if you apply it properly, I, I, I have full confidence. Uh, like I say, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I have full confidence in the Tamiya system because the culture over there where it was developed, they understood this. I'm not saying there isn't good um, equivalents to it, but you got to stick with the paint or go with the paint that you have confidence with and that you get consistent results with. Right? So, I guess I could have left this on because I don't really want this to be flat, but I might remask that later. I'll show that probably to put, like, to weather the top of that a bit. The top of the, uh, the anti glare on the hood, like that. So, that's pretty good. I'm actually quite happy with the way that paint session turned out. Um, it doesn't always come out as nice as you'd like, but I'm pretty happy with that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, clear coat with this X22. So I mix this about 50-50, not with IPA, but with the X20A thinner. Okay. 50-50 on this one, I think. And now this is clear. I'm only doing that for the decals. I want a really nice surface for the decals to go down. And to hug all the rivets and panels, I'm going to use uh, Solvacet as well. But I'm going to paint this and let it cure overnight. Okay, I don't mind working right away with flat. But when I do any clear coat, I like to wait at least, if I can, 24 hours. 48 hours if you can. Because the clear coat has a little bit of a different um, drying properties, I've noticed, than the XF. The X, okay, is usually clear coats and gloss indicator that's an x so xf is flat right which you can handle right away and even put solvents on and oil paint and everything but if you're going to clear coat it's a good idea especially if you're going to lay on solve set things like that okay okay so i've got the clear coat loaded up and uh, it's about 50-50 mix. Um, yeah, it's about 50-50. Maybe a, a little bit more, like maybe 60 thinner, 40 uh, clear. But either way, I don't think it matters that much. So I want to put a nice finish on this because there's decals going on there and on the side. Give it a good blast. Not worried about the roof too much, but the sides I want to make sure. See that? Nice and glossy. So that'll be good for uh, doing the decals. I know it seems like extra work, but it's really worth it. Like you'll have a beautiful model when it's done. And the decals will be rendered into paint. You'll see. And uh, you won't get that silvering. If you look at... I mean, everybody does it at some point in their painting um, pilgrimage, right? But you quickly learn eventually that it's worth... There's a reason why it's done this way. It's to, to guarantee that you get a beautiful decal application. And uh, like I say, I know there's people that disagree with this method. But that's fine. I'm going to stick with it because it works, okay? Okay, let's clear coat the long hood and the nose. Probably a good idea to make sure you get a nice full cup as well because you don't really want to run out at, when you're doing this. You want to get it all in one go if you can. So this gets a big decal on the nose. So I want to make sure that's glossed up good. And the side gets the meatball.
Okay, decal time. So I just want to talk to you about what I'm going to use, the tools I use, and the decals I'm going to use. So first of all, I got my reference photos from the prototype. Um, this is one good shot that I have, and I have the other side as well. You can see here that the font is quite large numbers on the number boards, and this font is not the same size as this, like the numbers. Um, so you're going to have a little bit of variances there. Um, okay, nothing's perfect in this world once again. I want to add this SD35 on the side. I'll have to wing that somehow with other decals or, or whatever. Um, I'll show you the two sets that I have. So this first set is for SRY rail link diesel hoods and switchers. Okay, HO scale 187, number 1258. Um, I really like these old white line head logo. You can see just the right dot. It wasn't called a meatball then, but I'll explain to you uh, that in a second. And it has a nice variation of all the different numbers and font for all the different locomotives, which is what this set doesn't have. It has some font numbering, but it, there are only two sizes. So I can use some of this as well. Now, this is a nice set, but this is, uh, I don't know why MC is here. I can't figure out what, why that's there, but they're Microsoft. Montana Rail Link, new logo for diesels. So this is the new meatball logo used on S or Y now. And you can see this is a Montana Rail Link uh, set, but it has MRL, but it also has S or Y, which stands for, or is an acronym for Southern British Columbia Railway. Okay, which is a carryover from the merger or the sale from BC Hydro, Southern British Columbia Railway to um, Dennis Washington Corporation, SRY. So I really like the meatball, the new logo. And then you can see the little baby meatballs that go on the nose, whereas the earlier versions never had that. They just had a red dot. So that's kind of cool. So that's by Microscale, and they're no-fail decals. They're excellent, um, second to none in terms of decals. Now, the tools I'm going to use is number 11, a pair of scissors, and some small little paint brushes. i got a ruler just in case. I'm just going to use regular water with a little bit of wetting solution. Um, so I've been using these since I can remember, since I was a kid almost, I think. This has been around Microsoft. Now, I won't be using Microset for a couple of reasons. I will be using Microsol, however. Microset is really only good for maybe setting a solution on a really uneven surface. But the problem is, is it will uh, leave stains on some paints. I don't know, like I can't predict it. I've had it happen where I've uh, laid a puddle of uh, this Microset on a model and then I lay the decal on and by the time all the decal process is done, there's a stain and I know it's not from this. I never get a bad reaction from Microsoft. Some might, but I never have. So I'm not using this. I don't want to take a chance because the stain wouldn't go away. Even when I re-clear coated it, the stain was still there. So the only way you're ever going to get rid of a stain like that is either strip and repaint the locomotive, which <laughs> there's no way I'm going to do that, or you weather it away somehow. So, But if you want a more newer finish, you're stuck with it. So I'm not using Microset. Only Microsoft. So you can see the finish. It's nice and glossy. So that'll give me good confidence. And these decals will sit down really nice and all the numbering and font, etc. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, see how that turns out, okay? Okay, finally the meatball. So I remember during COVID, you couldn't get any of this Microsoft, <laughs> at least the hobby shops where I was. So I, I was like doing a locomotive and some cars too. I was like, oh no, right? I had a tiny bit left, but so when it came back in, I bought three bottles just to have on hand because I don't want to run out of this. Anyway, I like to flood it on um, and I do it two or three times. Okay. And then I come in with a sharp knife 
like a number 11 uh, sometimes and I'll and I'll just poke a hole sometimes if it's a really deep reveal and then just wick in microsol and it, it just conforms it nicely uh, if you're very gentle with it now if you I like to add the microsol as soon as I can because I want to hopefully it capillaries under the deck it just helps it to bite down so much nicer um, anyway three or four times I do it like on larger font and then it settles in really nice and uh, it doesn't leave a stain on this Tamiya clear coat at all neither does the uh, you know the the water that I'm using Okay, so I just want to point out something regarding the nose chevrons stripe set. Now, uh, this does not come with this Montana Rail Link set. So, you need two sets. You need this older SRY set too, and they have four. They have four nose uh, chevron decals, right? See? So. You need both sets to do this particular unit, and this is fairly accurate. Uh, they have the right amount of stripes and chevrons, but this bottom chevron tip is not there on the prototype. I believe it is on the GP9s, but not on... I'll have to check that, actually, to be honest with you, but... It's funny little things like that you don't notice right away until you actually build up a model like this little things like that so that's what it'll do and uh, that will go on the front like that and then once this is all set and done i'll put the little meatball over top of it Okay, so how's everybody doing so far? It's a rather longer video than usual, right? So this closing particular segment of this painting a custom locomotive is the most important part, okay? And I've had to amend this video for several reasons. Uh, I finished the video and I thought, well, I wasn't that happy with all the footage. I had a little bit of a struggle with the lens that I had, trying to get depth of field up close. Uh, I don't know why, but that lens has been replaced by the one I have now which I'll probably talk about down the road, but it's probably my biggest investment on the whole channel, like seriously big investment. And I've upgraded my lighting as well. So that's, so what, that's the changes that are coming to the channel. I've upgraded my equipment finally. It just took me a while because it's expensive. Good, good lenses, like I don't care about the camera body really. It doesn't make that much difference really, but it's the lens and the lighting that makes all the difference in the world for image and i'm sort of intolerant for things that are not in focus and i'm sorry that if some of the previous video during the process was not totally in focus that really bothered me but guess what there's nothing i can do about it you can't sharpen it and it's been done and when you do a lengthy how-to video like this uh, you're bound to have dropouts and issues where some of the videos fail but i'm getting better at that and you're going to see far and far less of that now that well, number one, I have more experience in this studio in this type of setting. And shooting miniatures is always a challenge. Like outdoor one-to-one -one scale photography is easy. Especially if you have training in black and white, which I do in the past. But anyway, let me get on with this part because this is really important. Okay, so this is a bit of a summary. So because I never showed a lot of the clear coating process that I wanted to show. So I'm going to summarize it here in closing and then the decoder install will follow this as part four so watch for that it's fairly it's about an hour long as well so the whole so there's four parts in this whole series that i've tried to cover as comprehensively as i could right so um when you pre-coat like when you clear coat before the decals right um you do that because flat 
paint is easy to paint. Like you're never going to get orange peel with flat paint. But if you shoot gloss color, it's got to be heavier. It's more difficult. But if you shoot flat colors and then you clear coat a little with a heavier clear coat at the very end, it covers a multitude of sins and can produce remarkable finishes. Like this is semi-gloss here, flat here. And then the side of the locomotive after the deckling was all set is semi-gloss and then flat paint down here. That's, that's how I chose to finish it. So what you're going to get though before you put the decals on is you're going to get a little bit of what looks like orange peel um, before you lay the decals on. But that doesn't matter because I use semi-gloss and it's going to look a little mottled. But the point is, is you want to seal all the pores in the flat paint. So that part of the process is not going to look that great. So when you put the decals on, you won't get any silvering on the decal. Like, like it won't show as a decal, it'll look like paint. Now when you're done, then you choose what you want to clear coat with. So, so I just explained to you that I used semi-gloss on here, which, which uh, unifies and reconciles any paint anomalies that might have been there because you didn't need to have a finished coat prior to de deckling. You want to put your finished coat on or think of that in terms of your final finish on the model. And I'm just going to show you now the four clear coats just to make it clear and the thinner that I use to finish the model with once the decals are on and dry and you're ready to finish coat it, right? So I use this X20A thinner for all locomotive painting when I mix my paint. I don't use IPA. I use IPA for almost everything else, for weathering, etc. But when I do a, a body finish, uh, I like to use their thinner because I don't want to introduce IPA to any of the paint because if you put a clear coat over top, sorry, not the base, sorry, get that out of there. Uh, if, if you put a clear coat like flat clear, semi-gloss clear, or flat clear, okay not x21 i'll talk about that in closing at the end if you're going to put clear coat over top of paint that has ipa base in it you run a risk of anomalies so use this for when you do your locomotives and your clear coats okay that use the recommended thinner for all your clear coats okay now remember how people have mentioned this remember how i've, I've used way in, way back in the past flat base I don't use this in my airbrush and it's a chalky finish. I use it for weathering and texturing. So do not use X21 on your model at all when you do finish. Not this one, okay? Let me show you the one that people get mixed up. They get it mixed up with flat clear. See? Don't use X21. Use XF86 for flat clear. This is excellent. And it's like the old tester's dull coat, but in the acrylic. Okay, not the solvent or acetone or whatever base toxic kind of paint. Even though Tester's Dull Coat is, was awesome, awesome flat coat. I think I have one or two saved for that one locomotive, you know. But anyway, I've come to use this now because it's excellent. So remember, so when you want to clear coat your model, like if you want a nice shiny new kind of finish, right, I like to use semi-gloss clear because it seems to scale better. This is X35. You can use this for pre-deckling and final deckling if you want, if you want that kind of a finish. But I don't normally use this. I might add some in my blue initially, but you don't really have to. This, this particular uh, locomotive finish is finished with semi-gloss. See the finish? It's good, right? But it was flat, wasn't it? It was flat paint. So if you have any anomalies, like you figure, like there might be an anomaly like orange peel. Well, orange peel is hard to fix if it's in the base coat paint. But if you get a bit of orange peel in your semi-gloss pre decal finish, don't worry about it because it's clear coat. And when you do the final clear coat, it'll all disappear. Trust me, it will. Okay? So you can't judge the process when you're watching the video. You can't say like halfway in between, oh, look at that, right? The finish isn't that great. Wait until it's finished and then you spray down your model. So what I did here in closing was flat on the top, flat clear, right? Okay, just to be sure about that, so you know, I put flat clear X8, X86 
86 on the top with the airbrush. Then I did the sides, loaded up the airbrush with semi-gloss clear. I didn't worry about any bleed on the side because that's part of the blend of, of the prototype when you see the photos, okay? And then I used flat clear, or, or pardon me, no, uh, I didn't use any gloss. I just used the flat clear on the top and then the semi-gloss here and then the flat clear down on the trucks down here okay so that's how I got this finish okay so there it is she's all done she looks beautiful on the layout and I just want to say thank you to everybody for following the series I hope you learned something from it so part four is the decoder install and I show a little bit of detailing the last touches on the railings and etc okay so cheers happy modeling and I hope that you have a great day